My interest in electrical engineering goes way back. Before long, I was ordering books on electronics and starting to read it. And then, with the help of my parents, got a shortwave radio kit, a little regenerative radio that I built with my father's help, and started listening to shortwave broadcasts. And this was in the like early 50s, and I remember one of the things I picked up was a radio Moscow English language broadcast. Very subversive, if you think about it, with the climate in the early 50s. And so I chose electronics as the area that I would study. I did my undergraduate work at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. And as a senior, I applied for and was very lucky to be awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship. And I looked at that as a ticket to go just about anywhere in the United States. And I had heard good things about California. I don't think I'd ever been more than a few miles west of Niagara Falls. And I decided to come out to California and do graduate work at Stanford University. And I came out, fell in love with California, and fell in love with Stanford. <laughs> While I was doing undergraduate work, I got a summer job. Um, it was a General Railway Signal Company. My father worked there, and while he was not in electronics, he knew the head of the electronics lab, and at one point mentioned to him about my interest in electronics. So they had me a summer job doing electronic assembly and working with transistors. And in 1954, the junction transistor was only about three years old. So this was an incredible opportunity to work on a brand new uh, part. And so, in fact, even my second summer there, I was assigned to work with two engineers on a, on a specific type of railway signal. Uh, and they came to me at the end of the summer and said they'd liked several suggestions that I had made in the course of working with them. They were filing for a patent and they named me as a co-inventor. And so my first patent was filed and the filing date was actually a few weeks before I turned 18. I got my PhD from Stanford in 1962 and I stayed on not as a faculty member, but as a researcher. At one point, I got a telephone call. The caller introduced himself as Bob Noyce. Now, I knew who he was, and I had met him once before. And Bob said he was starting a new company. Would I be interested in talking to him about a position? And I been at Stanford now doing this research work for about six years after getting my PhD. There used to be a researcher from Fairchild who would come around to talk us, to us about students that might be getting near the end of their program, see whether it would be appropriate for Fairchild. Yeah, his name was Rex Rice. And I used the opportunity to talk to Rex and find out what's going on in the semiconductor industry. And it seemed to me, and in talking to Rex, that the semiconductor technology was making such advances that at some point it might be reasonable to think about doing semiconductor memory. Now, when I went for the interview with Bob Noyce, the new company had no place to meet yet, so I ended up interviewing at his home. And one of the questions Bob asked me what do I think the next big area for semiconductors should be? And based on those discussions I'd had with Rex Rice from Fairchild, I said, I think memory is another area to look at. And I didn't know it, but Bob and Gordon had decided that their new company would develop semiconductor memory. So I think maybe that answer more than anything helped me get the job. The three founders of Intel, first of all, there were Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, and Andy Grove should probably be considered a founder, although he was not officially one. Each one played a major role in the early days and the subsequent days of the company. Now, Bob was very personable, very smooth, you know, 
probably a salesman at heart, although his training was in technology. Gordon, background was in chemistry, chemical engineering. He was much more sort of reserved, but a deep thinker. And Andy Grove was the hard-headed manager that would make things happen. And these three gentlemen, each with different styles, worked together so effectively to make Intel a su the success it turned out to be. And in particular, Andy, more than anything, helped to get the company organized. A few years after its founding, he installed a system he called Management by Objective. Now, engineers tend to be notorious optimists. Ask an engineer how long it's going to take him to complete a project, and he says, I'll have it done in you know, a month. The trouble is, a month later, you ask him again, and, well, it's still going to be a month. Andy would point out, that means you've made zero progress. Instead, each engineer had to predict, as part of his progress report, what he would accomplish in the following month. And then, as part of the progress report, compare actual progress against the predicted progress. Well, a lot of us learned very quickly what optimists we had been, and we started to generate much more realistic um, you know, projections of what would be done. I think more than anything, that helped make Intel one of the most successful companies ever created. In the case of the microprocessor, Intel set up to do memory. And the major customers for memory would be the large computer companies. They tended to be relatively conservative and very concerned about reliability. So before they would adopt a new technology, it had to be well proven. And so what semiconductor companies do when faced with a situation like that do a specific job for one customer on the idea that as soon as you can make a part for him, he's going to buy it, and very likely buy it in volume. Our first such customer was a Japanese calculator company that sold, had a number of names, but sold calculators under the name Busycom. And Intel agreed to make LSI for their calculators as of April of 1969. So the company was less than a year old, probably just about six months old. And then two months later, an engineering team arrived from Japan to actually bring the requirements for this chipset to Intel. And by this time, I knew a bit about Intel's capabilities and I became rather concerned that the chipset that was being proposed was quite a bit more complex than we had been led to believe in the April meeting. So I took my concerns to Bob Noyce, who I reported to at that time, and he suggested, well, if there's anything you think you could do to make it easier for Intel, you know, why don't you try to pursue it. Bob encouraged me to do my own work in that area, and there were a number of areas that looked to me like they were places that could, could make um, some significant change. And again, this was a series of small steps in trying to improve the Busycom design that finally led to the microprocessor. Little changes, one at a time, added up to what ultimately became the 4004, the first microprocessor. Well, one of my first, in fact, a memory from my early days at Intel was Gordon Moore invited me into his office and he showed me an article that he had published, um, actually I believe it was a few years before when he was at Fairchild, in which he was predicting that the number of components on an integrated circuit would be increasing with time, doubling roughly every year or two. And he had actually plotted some of the early Intel products on his chart, and if anything, they were above his projection. They were even more aggressive than his projection predicted. In about 1974, a researcher at IBM published a, an article 
projecting and predicting it would be advantageous to make things significantly smaller. Now, at the time that article was published, the typical feature size, if you did it in nanometers, would be around 5,000 nanometers. We called it five microns. We have been making things smaller and smaller and smaller. And today, the feature size people are talking about are in the 10 to 20 nanometer range. There are many questions as to whether Moore's law is at its end or not. In fact, I believe I have some articles that are maybe from six or seven years ago in which people predicted that things could not be made any smaller and that Moore's law had come to an end. And Today, we're making things maybe one-tenth the dimension that that article <laughs> was discussing. But it could be a change in the economics of the industry if we no longer have this ability. One of the unique aspects of Stanford and its history is it, the fact that it played a major role in technology here in what we now call Silicon Valley. In fact, I think it may have been one, probably the major player. One of the people who's given considerable credit, and I believe deserves every bit of it, is Fred Turman, who was uh, here at Stanford for some years and very, very much interested in working with local industry and maintaining a good relationship between the university and local industry. Stanford had things like the Industrial Park where Stanford land became the actual location for high-tech companies, companies like Hewlett-Packard and so on. And there were co-op programs where Stanford students would be working perhaps some of their time with these local companies. And that seems to me to be almost unique in terms of the normal relationship between the world of academia and the world of industry. In fact, to the point where uh, it seems today you have more and more technical uh, institutions who would just love to be able to duplicate what was done here in Silicon Valley. But I think Stanford plays a huge role in that. There are a number of areas that I like to emphasize when I'm talking to, to young people. Um, one thing is that you have to be very careful in what is you know, popular wisdom. It's not always correct. Um, the general view, even when it comes to like the microprocessor, I mean, it seems like the main media tends to think the only use for microprocessors is making, you know, basically notebook computers or things of that nature. When we first came out with the microprocessor, we didn't look to put them into computer boxes. We were looking for other applications. And that came under the name ultimately was called embedded control. And today the media still does not seem to be aware of embedded control. And to give an idea, as an example, back in 1996, those of us who were involved with a microprocessor were recognized by the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And it was done at a ceremony open to the local public. This was in Akron, Ohio. Maybe several thousand local residents in attendance. And they told the attendees that they might have driven there in an automobile that was designed with the aid of a notebook computer. And we looked at ourselves and said, they missed the point entirely. Probably everybody drove there in an automobile that was running under computer control. That computer control is what we mean by embedded control. In fact, when I talk to young people, I like to say, I am an example of embedded control because I have a cardiac pacemaker in, in me that helps keep my heart running at its proper rhythm. So in effect, even there is a microprocessor.